Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. Today we remember the career of outgoing St. Louis County prosecuting attorney Bob McCullough. He's held the office since first elected in 1991 and will turn it over to Wesley Bell in just a couple of days. Prosecutors are often controversial. McCullough's no exception. He joins me in studio to talk about his 26 years in office. Also with us is St. Louis Public Radio's Rachel Lippman. Rachel, thank you for being with us. And Bob, great to see you. Oh, thanks hope, for having me. Hope you're all ready for the holidays and the big uh, transfer of power. Sure. Yeah. And it's 28 years. Right? 28 years. Just- yeah, well, it'll be 28, yeah. but when you finally... Yeah. 28 to the day. Okay, but who's counting, right? Uh, I think he is. The <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Are you leaving Bob with uh, relief or regret? Oh, you know, neither one, really. I mean, I, I understand how the process works. Not exactly how I planned on exiting, but at the same time, I have zero regrets. And, you know, it was a, the, a great job. Uh, with wonderful people around and some terrific people, and and we did a lot of good over the years. And you know, as I told a number of people, that we always did what was appropriate under any particular circumstances. And I try to instill that in the in the uh, prosecutors I hired and the victim service people. That look, no one is ever going to know as much about the case you've got than you. Mm-hmm. And so and no matter how hard they try, no matter how well or ill-intentioned they are, they're not going to know as much as you. And so based on everything you've got, you do what's right in that situation. And somebody doesn't like it because they've only got half the facts or somebody loves it because they've only got half the facts, that's just part of the deal. So you go about your business. And the worst that happens is what happened. You know, it's, believe me, it's not the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life is losing an election. You know, you know. Uh, because we did what we thought was appropriate all the way through, I have zero regrets. What's the transition been like uh, with Wesley Bell? It's, you know, it's uh, not so bad, I guess. <laughs> you know, that we, uh, uh, we've met a couple times, uh, and he's met with, uh, met with the staff and talked with them. And so whatever they've asked for, we've, we've provided and tried to guide them in a couple different areas because they don't know a whole lot about the office or the process or the procedure or – or the job, for that mm-hmm. matter. So, you know, trying to guide them into uh, some of the areas that uh, that they may not know at anything at all about. You know, there's a lot, obviously, of in administrative, and you're dealing with government agencies. You're dealing with, you know, everybody from uh, our dysfunctional county council to to our dysfunctional federal government. So. Did I say that? (laughs) Has has he been receptive to what you've been trying to tell him, especially about some of the administrative side? Is he acknowledging that? I mean, I think so. I mean, that that uh, that I couldn't tell you other than, you know, we've 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 talked about that. And of course, anything they they wanted, they were looking for. We made sure that they they had it, including access to the uh, to the staff to meet with them as a group or individually, however they wanted to do it. So. So, yeah, I think so. I mean, and as I said to him and I tell a lot of people that there's nothing magical about the structure I have in the office. You know, it's just, you know, but uh, but that works for me and it's it's worked well and we've fine-tuned it and then adjusted it and changed it completely over the years. And um, I, I suggested to him that you take advantage of that, take advantage of the, the ex, uh, expertise and the experience that is there and then, you know, make whatever adjustments you think are, are appropriate, whatever you need. But but and I think he's at least what I've heard some of the stuff that he's inclined to not make massive immediate changes, which I think is he'd be well served to to talk to all the people mm-hmm. as he is doing. I get the sense that you may be a little concerned. Uh, you, you mentioned his lack of experience and that sort sure. of thing. Are you? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's you know, it's <clears throat> it's like any other job, and particularly if you you know. I've always promoted from within, for example, the people who are the senior people in my office are not just senior in the number of years that they've been there. It's the experience that they've developed over that, you know, whether they're supervisors, whether they're the top trial attorneys in the office, they didn't start off at that. And and I've never hired from the outside. I've always hired from within thinking that if I've got an office this big and I don't have worthy people within to promote to a, to a new position, then I'm doing something wrong. And 
and we've had that you know over the years and and that's that's a big deal just as an example the three people who are leaving january 1 you know there's the the elected of course and then there are two non-civil service positions and so we're all leaving the end of the year um that is 95 years cumulative experience uh just us three in that office not overall not total but in that office 95 years um, it's being replaced by zero years. So, so there's going to be a learning curve there, and it, it's neither right nor wrong. It, it is what it is. But, but you know that uh, there's a lot to learn. <laughs> well, one gets the sense also that the members of the staff are certainly concerned because they've all just voted to join a police union. Sure. Well, they're they're concerned, and I think um, you know based on a lot of the rhetoric that. Uh, that occurred during the campaign about, you know, people got to go. You know, there are people in that office that got to go. They got to get out. I'm, you know, bringing in my own people. You know, we're going to put it. So it's that that uh, caused a lot of concern, and, and, and I think rightfully so. You know, civil service is civil service is something of a protection, but they're not there for the employee. They're not representing the employee. And so so their, their concern was that there, there is nobody – um, representing them, and you know, and their interests are are different. You know, they're they're professionals. They're uh, highly experienced. They're very very good at what they do. If I say so myself, mm-hmm. and I will. Um, and they're concerned that you know, yeah, that you know, people, you know, somebody comes in from the outside with no experience, and now all of a sudden has taken the top position. Well, that limits their chances to move up and move on and and remain in the office. So who knows? I, I think they're I think they're legitimate concerns. Uh, about that. Was this something that they had ever advocated before while you were um, in this leadership roles? Is, had they ever approached you to say, hey, we'd like to have the protections mm-hmm. of a union? No, no, that never came up. So, And mm-hmm. I think part of that was they, they knew I was certain I've been an advocate for my employees uh, for as long as I've been there. Um, and whether that was fighting with the county council over something or somebody else, uh, but, you know, and, and it was a fight at times. You know, I um, something I'm very proud of that we accomplished many years ago. We we convinced <laughs> I was going to say shamed them into it, but, but we convinced the county council years ago to change the pay structure so that we could retain people. You know, I left after seven years, which is probably three or four years longer than I should have stayed from a financial standpoint as an assistant. I loved that job. It's the only job I wanted to do. I went to law school for that job. Uh, but you couldn't make a living at it. You couldn't make a career out of being a prosecutor. And one of the things I'm most proud of is that with that and with the, the more recent, um, not when we really did shame them into, into uh, making it a, a well-paying job to bring it through mm-hmm. so that with the Prop P money that was out there was part of that so that you can make a career out of being a prosecutor in St. Louis County, and that's that's a true benefit, not just for the for the individual, but for the community, because that is a job where you you know if I'm a crime victim and you know somebody's taking my case to court, I want them to know that they I want to know they know what they're doing and they've done it and they can handle all that. Well, what kind of actual protections does the staff have now that they have uh, voted to join this union? Well, that I couldn't tell you. Um, but they have representation, so that's that's a key part about it, with it, you know. That uh, so, and and I don't know. I mean, that's that's something I think that gets developed uh, through that. As an employer, I keep in mind there are rules and regulations, federal rules and regulations. So, as the employer, even though I'm very much an advocate of them and I'm very strong labor supporter, organized labor, um, I had to steer clear of. Any attempt to influence. So you didn't have any input at all with no. regard to staffers uh, making no. this move? No, no. Putting the issue or the need of forming a union aside, mm-hmm. do you understand the concern that people have about it being the police officers association they're joining? You know, I, I you know, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a concern. I mean, it's, you know, it is one where we're accused. And I think that's a big part of the reason why they, they went where they did as opposed to a, a closer to home uh, uh, department, so there won't be that that uh, direct concern that that hey, wait a minute, uh, these guys are representing you now, and now you're supposed to look at them. So, uh, and I have every 
uh, every faith in the staff that they always have, and I'm sure always will, this group, mm-hmm. um, be able to look at things impartially and do it. You know, we've never hesitated to to charge the police when they ought to be charged or anybody else, you know. And, and that, it, there's a lot, you know, always made, particularly since Ferguson, that, uh, you know, the prosecutors and the cops are the same. Well, so they shouldn't have anything to do with it. But we work closely with lawyers, too. I'm a lawyer, and I work very closely with lawyers. And we prosecute lawyers when they do something wrong. You know, I work uh, very closely with other prosecutors, and we prosecuted other prosecutors when they did something wrong. It's, if you have a conflict, a, a and the conflict's defined in the statute, and I won't bore you with all the details, then you recuse yourself. But if there's no conflict, then... And I've done that in cases where there was a conflict, when I knew the people, when I was close with them, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, and and my, my fairness might be uh, clouded a little bit by having known some of these guys forever, not just worked with them, but some I knew long before they were cops or I was a prosecutor kind of a deal. But... You know, more often than not, well, almost all the time, and in those cases, we did get somebody outside, ask the court to appoint a special, but, you know, more often than not, we don't know them and didn't know the judges we prosecuted, didn't know the prosecutors and all that, or the lawyers. You mentioned Ferguson, and the coals have been raked over many, many times uh, following the Michael Brown shooting. When you look back at that, do you see anything you think you might have done differently during that time? Uh, There are things I would have liked to have done differently. That's really about it. No, uh, I knew my responsibility going in. I, you know, had been a prosecutor for a long, long time at that point, and it was not something that, you know, I'm going to be subject to intimidation by, you know, people with ulterior motives screaming at me and yelling and all that. That that doesn't bother me in the least. So we're, we're going to go about our business and do what prosecutors are supposed to do, and that is gather all the evidence and information, and in this case, present it to an impartial, um, separate legal body to make the determination uh, as to whether there, uh, whether there should be something there. The only thing I would like to have done, but I couldn't do by the rules and the statutes, the ethical rules, is release a lot of information as we were going. I didn't bother Eric Holder and his Justice Department, mm-hmm. but, but uh, I couldn't do it. One of the things that, that comes up uh, and has come up over the years from time to time is an accusation that you're racially insensitive. Do you uh, – what, what's your response to that? Do you feel in any sense that you might be? No. I mean I really don't. We, we – you know, half the time you – know, I can think of different press conferences when, when you know, we're announcing that we filed charges against somebody and, and then they would ask, OK, you know, how old is the guy? I got to look to see what his age is. OK, what's his race? I got to look to see what the race is. You know, we don't. We have all that information because it's part of identification and the like. But no, we. And I think if you look back at the cases and the way they're handled, that you know, you're gonna you're gonna see that a a very comparable case, whether it's a black defendant, white defendant, or Bosnian or anybody else, is is comes out in the same uh, gets treated the same way. So. Uh, people make that argument, but you know, again, it's if you drill down into it and you ask them to drill down into it, they can't back it up because there's nothing to back it up with. Where do you think that came from? Then, like, if you look back on your career, mm-hmm. are there places uh, places where you sit and you look and you say, you know, I could see how this would be interpreted as potentially being racially insensitive, or how does that narrative get started? Well, I think part of the narrative is you look at the uh, uh, a number of the people, and I. I won't name any just yet, but you know that everything to them is racially motivated, and no matter what it is, it's racially motivated as far as they're concerned. And if you look and dig into that a little bit, you will see that that's how they support themselves, and they do a great disservice to the minority community in general, not just African Americans, but other minorities, because. People get so tired of hearing that, hey, wait a minute, this guy robbed a bank. This guy raped this woman. How is that racial that we're prosecuting the guy for that? And it, that's what you hear from it. Yep. And that's, you know, and that it really, you know, there's some, you know, Al Sharpton comes to mind immediately that, you know, that's, he makes his living. He has no other visible means of support. That's how he makes his living by continuing to make these allegations, I mean, his entire career was built on a complete fraud, something he just made up. And, you know, and that, that myth gets perpetuated. 
And that does a whole lot of damage, and, and it, uh, it'll continue to do that damage. The yeah. reality is that, that you commit a crime, odds are in St. Louis County, at least until December 31, you're going to get uh, you're going to get prosecuted, and I could care less what uh, what your uh, ethnic. Okay, that's Bob McCullough, who is the county prosecutor. We're having a conversation as he is winding down his long career, 28-year career, at the St. Louis County Prosecutor's Office. We'll come back and continue the conversation, Rachel Littman and I, in just a moment. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Thank you for listening to this St. Louis on the Air podcast supported by University College at Washington University with undergraduate and graduate programs part-time evening and online. University College at Washington University offering world-class education within reach. Welcome back as we continue our conversation with Bob McCullough, the outgoing prosecuting attorney in St. Louis County. Now here's Rachel. I wanted to get your take on the situation that Don just described, the, the sort of the political situation that your, your successor is going to be walking into. Obviously, you mentioned that you have fought with the county council before. I'm just wondering from an outsider's perspective, mm-hmm. as someone who's been involved in county government now for 28 years, what the heck is going on? I, I don't know. That I, I mean, it is... To say that the council is dysfunctional is being, I think, pretty generous. You know, Pat Dolan is the only guy on the council who exercised any semblance of common sense. And, and unfortunately, Pat's caught up in the same thing I was caught up and won't be there. And so uh, so he won't be there in the fall. Tim Fitch will be there. And, and um, you know, and I think he'll bring some sense to it. But, you know, one at a time. But the good news always for me was that even though I'm the county prosecutor, I don't represent the county. I don't have a whole lot of connection to the county. I don't enforce county ordinances. I don't um, – any of that. I don't represent the county when they get sued like some uh, – more of the outstate prosecutors will. But, but of course, I have to depend upon the county for their uh, budget or for my budget, budget for the office. So – I mean, forever, no matter who it was on that council, you're always able to sit down. You might disagree about some things. You might disagree about, you know, a lot of things, but but it was civil. You could work with each other and say, well, I can't do that, but I can live with this. You know, and it's just and it's not just a council. I mean, you see it, I think, at every level of government now. It's just uh, I'm just happy I never had to deal in depth with it and and. uh and the, won't <laughs> the bu- the budget has just passed, sure. which is likely to be vetoed, as as I understand it. Sure, is that I don't imp- think we're not sure there's a mechanism to veto that. There's some mm-hmm. uh, confusion as to what uh, the yeah. county co- executive can do with the oh, budget. Really? But yeah, continue. Well, as 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 approved by the council, how would right. that impact your office? So? Well, I've not seen that, but uh, <clears throat> but you know, I know that the the entire council, other than than uh, Pat Dolan prior to August 6th was committed to taking all the Prop P money out of the prosecutor's office. And then after uh, the election, all of a sudden, uh, they weren't too interested in it. So, um, and it's that sort of game that you can tell. I mean, that's a game that's being played. And that's just, which kind of laid it out as clear as you could make it out, you know, I think in that. So, um, but I don't know what impact it's going to have. I don't know if they cut anything out of the process. I know they cut $5 million out of the police budget. Um, that obviously is going to have a huge impact on the police department and on public safety. And so, you know, the the, the prosecutors and the police are a, are public safety. Our goal is to make the the streets as safe as possible. The police working the streets and us working the aftermath of that to, to try to keep the dangerous people away from everybody, and to take those who ought to be in treatment who have some issues and get them into treatment and do as much of that as we can. Um, so anytime you, you tamper with that, you know, and in, in particularly when you're just playing games to get back at the county executive or the county executive does something to get back at them, it just it damages public trust and it damages the, uh, the public. It, it makes them less safe. And that's that's a bad thing. I wanted to get back to something you had mentioned in discussing Councilman Dolan. You said that mm-hmm. he got caught up in the same thing you did. What, yeah. what is that same thing? What do you think you guys both got caught up in August? Well, we got caught up in the uh, the uh, 
Bernie Sanders crowd has kind of taken over a, a lot of the primary, and and mine was a little bit different. His was because he's in a, obviously one seventh of the county and not that, but but you know the 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 people who I think the more I talk to any of them at, at some of the political meetings throughout the campaign, you're thinking this guy honestly believes that free means nobody's paying for it, mm-hmm. and that you know it's just. So, so when they talk that stuff, you're thinking, no, somebody's paying somewhere along the line, and that's that's what the, I just don't think they get it. Um, mine was different, you know. I had the uh, the ACLU and other organizations funded by George Soros coming in and dumping. I think when it's all told, it's about a half a million dollars in to oppose my reelection, and you know, and that was just wrong. Because the ACLU, I, I've said before, I'll say it again, if the ACLU is associated with anything they say, there's a big lie involved, hmm. no matter what it is. And they did that uh, throughout my campaign uh, and spent a ton of money on it. They, it all came from Soros. So you get caught up in that and in all the self-proclaimed progressives and reformers and, and, it, and everything they talked about, we've been doing for decades. <laughs> Did you, you bitter about? Excuse me, Reggie. You bitter about that? Uh, you know, I'm. I know it's part of the uh, the process and how it goes that you do that. Now, it's really not with the ACLU. They're uh, they have a tax exempt status, and yet they engaged in politics. They filed statements that said, you know, we spent this money with the ethics commission. They filed them. We spent a quarter of a million dollars to oppose the reelection of Bob McCullough. Now, you can't have it both ways. It's sort of. Guy walks into a bank and, you know, slips the teller a note saying, give me the money and nobody gets hurt. By the way, I neither deposit nor uh, take money from banks. You know, you don't get it both ways. And and so they, they, they've they got some issues they're going to have to address. But bitter is probably not a good word for it. It's just, it, you know, it's a reality. I mean, that's that's the way the political system works now. There's so much dark money. And this really isn't even dark. The only thing I'd give George Soros credit for is he makes no secret about the millions that he's given to the ACLU and others for the sole purpose of removing uh, prosecutors like me. And if, like me, I mean, people have been around for a while. If you've yeah. been around a while, he thinks you're evil and you got to go. If you look back on it, on, yeah. on you know, watching other races around the, on the, mm-hmm. the country, did you miss it? Did you miss the possibility that oh, no. um, this, no. this could happen? No, not at all. I mean, you could you could kind of see it coming, and and you could feel it. And part of that is there's a system that we have in Missouri, which they don't have. When you look at at some of the other states where uh, Soros lost everything, those were different sorts of primaries where everybody's on the ballot, and so you get to vote for only one for office, but you get to vote everybody's on there. So. Missouri, for example, if you wanted to vote for Nicole Galloway for treasurer and, I don't know, Ann Wagner for council, or, uh, Congress, you couldn't do it. You'd have to pick one or the other and do that. Other states, you don't have to do that. Now, you only get to vote for one person for treasurer, one vote person for council, but, but you get For, for the party. It's, it's a partisan primary. You have to pull the, the party ballot. Correct. Mm-hmm. And prosecutors, real prosecutors, don't really fit into Democrats or Republicans. You know, so it's it never did. <laughs> Get, getting back to uh, public safety issues, sure. there's a, a proposal being floated now uh, by a state legislator to consolidate, merge, and reduce the number of small police departments in St. Louis County. Good idea? Bad idea? I, I When you get to the absolutes, it's generally a bad <clears throat> idea. If you don't have this, you can't. The, the, there should be some mechanism. I've always been a proponent of it and pushed it that – if your municipality does not have the resources to provide the services that are necessary, and that includes law enforcement, then you should be compelled to do something else with it. Either you disband or you contract with somebody to do that. But to just say, if you've got fewer than 5,000 people, then you can't have a department. You got you know, Ledoux has fewer than 5,000 people, but they are certainly in a position to provide a top-notch police department. Pine Lawn probably has about the same number, and they don't have the resources for that. So that's that's a different issue. So you can't just uh, – there has to be a mechanism for it. And frankly, when um, Councilman O'Mara and Councilman Dolan and a couple others tried to push the minimum standards, well, there was pushback from, from the munis, some who just wanted to maintain that uh, that control. You control the police department, you control a lot of things, even if it's a not a top-notch department. 
wouldn't it be more efficient if, in fact, there were fewer police departments in St. Louis County? Well, to some extent, yes. Yeah. But, you know, and, it, you know, and maybe eventually it comes to that. But I think initially, you know, what I've always stressed that I thought would be a good situation is that there are standards set. And if you can't meet those standards because you don't have the resources, then you have to do something. If, if you want to be a municipality of 500 people and you can provide the basic services for your your residents knock yourself out but if you can't then i don't care if you got five million if you can't something has to happen because you're putting them at risk off the top of your head can you think of a minimum standard that you would want to see something that you could set as a guideline and say this is what you have to be able to provide is it through certification is it through what's the mechanism here well it, it's it, it's it's a lot more complex than that because and and you know and i don't uh I don't know about staffing of departments, for example. You know, I mean, if you want to have a police officer on duty, one officer on duty 24-7, 365 days a year, you need more than three police officers. And so how many more, I couldn't tell you. Um, but that's what we have experts in that area for. And another, there aren't any of them on the council, by the way. On another subject uh, that has raised some eyebrows, uh, it's been reported that you have told your staff not to uh, not to take cases before a couple of judges in county. Uh, I assume that report is true, and if so, why? Why is it true? No, why why are you doing it? <laughs> why did you do it? It is accurate, and um, every attorney and every party has a, a, an absolute right by the the rules drafted and promulgated by the Supreme Court to take a change of judge within a certain time frame, um, with no questions asked, no question need to be given, mm -hmm. or no answer or reason need to be given. And so that's where I am. It, there, there's a time in every lawyer's life when you think that your client would be better served by having a different judge hear this case. Sometimes that's a single case, an individual case. Sometimes it's every case of the, of the type you handle. And... You know, it's not an uncommon thing. The only thing uncommon is that a prosecutor did it. You know, mm -hmm. public defenders do it all the time. You get a new prosecutor. My my uh, chief trial attorney for years, Dean Waldemar, was appointed to the bench. And a number of the public defenders automatically take a change from him if a criminal case is assigned to him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, you know, that's their call. That's their decision. And um, so I came to the conclusion, I don't do anything, never did, based on one single occurrence. Uh, never do anything in a fit of pique at all. Um, but I came to the conclusion that, that uh, the people we serve, crime victims, uh, would be better served uh, by having their cases heard by different judges. Because they generally have a tendency to be, be too lenient, is that? Because they would be better served by having other judges hear their cases. What are some of the remaining cases, remaining things? I think you've got about two weeks left in office. Right. What are some of the uh, remaining things you're trying to, to wrap up to get through before you turn the office over? Well, there really isn't anything. Um, you know, the case, there's nothing you can really wrap up. We're trying to make this as smooth as possible, the transition with that. But but again, it's, there's there's a time timing involved. You know, I make decisions until December 31. Uh, the new people will make the decision right after that. Our business generally, though, is it's immediate or it's long term. And so there's nothing long term we're doing right now. And I've told everybody in my office that, look, until somebody tells you different, your job in January is what your job is right now. And I think Mr. Bell's told him the same thing. Um, so if something happens this afternoon, God forbid, I will deal with that. Um, or between now and December 31. And after that, that's the immediate aspect, and Mr. Bell will deal with it. Um, you may not know this, but the courthouse is pretty much shut down <laughs> for the rest of the – there's not a whole lot. We have a trial going on right now, and then and then there will be a few other things. But there's there's not a whole lot that's going to go on the next couple of weeks. Our, and that's our, got nothing to do with the change in administrations. Sure. That's just – Sure. Our, our time is winding down. What's the future hold for you? What are your plans? Uh, you know, my plan first of all is to do a whole lot of nothing for a while, <laughs> um, and then eventually I'll you know I'll do something. There are lots of options out there, but uh, but nothing for for a while. Just kind of let the dust settle and 
Um, you know, I've been drawing a paycheck since I was 14 years old and had jobs before that. So um, it's going to be unusual. I can't remember a time I only had one job and now I have none. So that's going to be different. But And then I'll end up doing something. I don't know what, a little of this, a little of that. What I do want, though, is, is, is the people in this county to know that um, I'd be eternally grateful to them for just giving me the, the opportunity, the privilege, the honor uh, to have served as their prosecutor for all these years. Um, you know, I have absolutely no regrets about any day that, that we went. There were some days when, yeah, you wanted to get on the train and just keep going. But that didn't last too long. But, no, it was, it was great. Um, and, and, you know, I've been very fortunate to have had their support all these years. And, and, uh, and I hope I serve them well. And last, but certainly not least, is is my family. You know, um, my wife uh, put up with an awful lot, starting, you know, when I ran. Our youngest was uh, only a few months old when, you know, when Mr. Westfall was making eh, some signs that he was going to run for executive. And so we talked about it and, and uh, came to the, the idea, well, let's start looking around, see what happens with it. And But I would tell you, without uh, without her support from start to finish uh, with four kids and, you know, a couple others popping in and out all the time. You know, none of this could possibly have occurred. And, and throughout Ferguson, throughout throughout 28 years, you know, she's been a sounding board, uh, kept me grounded, said, no, you idiot, you can't say that. I said, all right, fine. Let me change that. So It's not always so, easy on the family when you're in public it, life. You know, and it really isn't. And, and I will tell you that I never – fully understood the stress that that Ferguson put on, you know, uh, Carolyn and and my kids because you know you can say what you want about me and that doesn't bother me. But it bothered them hearing these terrible things being said and yeah there might have been a few things I left out when you know we're watching the news one night and it came on that two guys just got indicted for trying to buy a bomb to blow me up. I thought, "Ooh, I looked over and thought, oh, I forgot to tell you Sorry that. Sorry about that. that. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but yeah, that, and when it was over, I mean, that, that the emotions came out and, and I realized then that, you know what, this, this, this really did have an impact on, on, on my family. And that, uh, that's something that, that I'll never forget again. So. Well, you've had an impact as well on this community for all these 28 years now that I'm good one. I hope. On the, yeah. Thank you, Bob McCullough, for being with us. Thank Merry you. Christmas to you. Best you too. of luck to you and best wishes as you pursue whatever the next chapter is going to Great. be. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me down here again and, and all the talks we've had over the years. So. Yeah, there have been many. Rachel, thank you so thank much you. for being a part Always. of this conversation. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.